Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there are an awful lot of talks here, so thank you for taking the time to attend mine. My name is Joshua Locke. I'm going to try and provide an acronym-free introduction to software supply chain security, which is a lot of words to say, and um, that's why, pretty much why I wanted to give this talk is there's, there's a lot of interest in software supply chain security. Um, governments and organizations around the world are increasingly focused on it, and I wanted to try and kind of provide a, um, a cloud-native novice introduction to the problems and the ways we can go about solving them um, while avoiding any of the acronym soup that any technical domain tends to inherit. So my name's Joshua Locke. I'm an, a software engineer in Verizon's open source program office. And I'm gonna start with an introduction to um, software supply chains and uh, the security of them. So a software supply chain, what, what is a software supply chain? It's effectively all of the steps that go into producing uh, a piece of software. So you'll have someone writing some code, they'll push the code somewhere, hopefully a revision control system. Uh, the code will get picked up and built by uh, hopefully some kind of automation. Um, it will pull in a bunch of dependencies, uh, increasingly many dependencies in this day and age, and it will produce some kind of artifact packaged up that it then sends somewhere to be run. And this is a nice, simple model for what a software supply chain is. But of course, in reality, they are much more complex. They, um, each dependency we pull into our package has its own set of dependencies, typically. Um, and there are, of course, additional complexities in that there are boundaries of where our common tools uh, can observe. So the language package managers we typically interact with when we're building software um, don't uh, connect into the operating system package managers that prov provide the base images that we're running our um, software on, and of course the infrastructure that sits underneath that. So this, even this diagram uh, is a relatively simple view of software supply chain security, or a software supply chain, sorry. And if we want to think about securing uh, software supply chain, it's, it's useful to have a shared understanding of what that means. Um, most people, when they talk about software supply chain security, they're really thinking about how can they protect against unintended modifications of some software. And I really like this diagram. Uh, this is tamper-resistant tape on some medication. Uh, and this is how I kind of think of software supply chain security. We, we want to prevent someone from tampering with the software in production. Or if we can't do that, we'd like to know that someone has tampered with it. Uh, and so with the tape here, if someone's opened it, you can, there's clear evidence that the thing has been opened and, and tampered with before you've received it. So how does that map to our uh, model software supply chain? There are innumerable places where we can um, tamper with the software in production. Um, so you know, the developer's device might be compromised or the developer themselves might be compromised and introduce some malicious changes. Uh, the revision control repository itself, that could be compromised or the system that builds the software. And of course, basically what I'm saying is that any step here uh, is an opportunity to introduce some unintended changes. And all of the links between those steps as well are opportunities for a malicious actor to do some tampering um, and one thing that uh, is increasingly um, recognized, but for a very long time wasn't recognized in software production is that um, the, the, the devices, the machines, the infrastructure that we're building the software on has to be cared for with the same level of attention as where we're deploying it. So with some very high level kind of uh, overviews of software supply chain and securing them, I, I want to do a brief tour of what can go wrong when a software supply chain is compromised. So give some examples of how these compromises manifest by looking at some real world examples from previous years. This is um, a really interesting one. This is actually six years old now. In 2018, uh, the NPM package event stream was compromised. And the way that was compromised was the maintainer of the package um, had less time to spend on it. And another contributor came in, was making really high quality contributions. Uh, and eventually became a maintainer of the package. And a little while into their maintainership, they introduced an additional dependency 
Um, and if you looked at the source code for this dependency, it all seemed fairly innocuous. But that dependency had additional uh, malicious content that was included in the package content on the registry that wasn't in the revision control system. And the way this manifested is that people who installed this dependency um, were installing some malware that would look for a specific crypto wallet and uh, extract um, effectively your, your cryptocurrency, uh, redistribute it to the attacker. It took about two months to discover this, um, this compromise before it was fixed. <clears throat> Similar time frame, um, the Webmin project, which isn't a very cloud native project, I admit, but it's a, a web interface for doing server administration. And they had a build machine. They would build their, their projects for release uh, on this machine that was effectively under some contributor's desk or you know, similar uh, setup. And someone was able to get to that machine. It's obviously a high value target if you can compromise a bunch of servers for free. So someone was able to get on this build machine, uh, introduce a change in the packaging step, and nobody discovered this for around 18 months. So every release of this project for about a year and a half had this compromise introduced where um, the attacker could basically just get onto a bunch of servers uh, on the internet that were running Webmin uh, and do who knows what. Uh, and then a really big one, uh, in the winter of 2020, a lot of people working in security uh, didn't have a Christmas effectively. Uh, because the, the SolarWinds Orion project had a, um, a, a compromise that was delivered to all of their customers, uh, Fortune 500 companies, federal governments, lots of places that you don't want data exfiltration to happen. Uh, and the way this attack was delivered was a nation state attacker figured out that they could get onto the build server for the um, SolarWinds Corporation and substitute a modified source code file at kind of build time. So this, this file lived in the uh, malware's memory, was substituted in at build time, and then I don't think it was ever actually persisted to disk. And so it was really hard to detect. I think it took around a year before people noticed there was extra traffic coming out of their uh, systems. And um, yeah, a lost, a lost winter, uh, which is sadly a recurring theme in supply chain security. Another one, uh, almost the last one, one more after this, uh, and then we'll get back to some of the, what we can do about it and take the power back. But this was a, an interesting one because um, code cover is a tool for doing um, coverage analysis of software code. How, how well is the code covered by test? And they have a, an uploader script that would upload your coverage results to their server and do fancy analysis, draw some nice graphs and everything. And um, you could get this script through a Docker image to integrate into your uh, container pipeline. And the Docker image build process wasn't verifying that the script they were downloading from their own servers uh, was the script they expected. And someone was able to compromise their servers, put in a substitute script with some malicious content, uh, and then CodeCover would build this into their container images, which they recommended uh, their customers use. So for around three months, anyone who was using CodeCover had put this malicious content into their CI pipeline. So it could see um, you know, their environment, environmental variables, their, their source code, probably could get access to their data stores, all of this stuff that's part of your CI pipeline that you don't want uh, random people to be able to access um, was just kind of unwittingly exposed. And then finally, my favorite one, uh, which isn't actually a security compromise, but as with many software security issues, uh, there's, I, I think there's a strong overlap between kind of software quality and the rigor of our engineering practices and uh, the security of our software that we deliver. And the EV vendor Rivian uh, delivered an infotainment update that bricked their systems because someone fat fingered the build and pushed out a build with the wrong security certificates in. So all of their EV systems that were deployed to customers suddenly couldn't use the infotainment system because they had a, a test certificate basically. And I have to kind of scratch my head and probably cry into my pillow thinking about how, how do you accidentally release to all of your very expensive electronic vehicles? Um, and even describing it as a fat finger, that implies a very manual process for releasing this, this software that, um, yeah, really worries me. Um, don't buy cars, I guess. So 
what can we do um, as software producers, as people involved in software production, to secure our software supply chains? Most people, I think, or many people get into software um, as a creative act. And I think, I, I love doing creative software development, but I think uh, the creativity should be at your editor, and everything that happens after that should be as bland as possible. So I'm going to make a very tortured analogy to fast food franchises as I talk about software supply chain security for the next 10 minutes or so. Basically, the, the thesis is that your software production should be as predictable as a fast food franchise. So I can go to you know, a coffee chain anywhere in the world and get an equally mediocre coffee. Uh, that's, that consistency is like very replicated across this franchise, and you want the same thing for your, for your software. Another way of putting it is the creativity happens when you're preparing the menu, not when you're preparing the individual meals. So the first thing that any food handling organization should do is practice good hygiene. And in software terms, this is what I like to refer as to as covering your assets. Um, so you need to have strong hygiene around your secrets. Uh, this is going to be a synthesis of things like using passkeys, multi-factor authentication, short-lived secrets, um, not storing your, uh, your secrets in your revision control repository because that is a great way uh, that people find uh, credentials for getting into people's networks. And equally, uh, we have to practice infrastructure hygiene. So our configuration and deployment of our infrastructure should be highly automated, should follow principles of least privilege. Ideally, and this is a fairly big ask, but if you can have two-party review on your infrastructure changes the same way you might on your code changes and have someone kind of verify that the infra change is what you expect, you'll catch a bunch of human error and uh, potentially malicious uh, changes by doing that. And then the final piece is like we should, we need to make sure our infrastructure and our laptops and our development tools are all kept up to date to uh, make sure we don't have any known security vulnerabilities in those. So following these good hygiene practices will help mitigate credential leaks, um, prevent the exploitation of known exploitable vulnerabilities, and will also help protect against human error, which is a frequent source of security problems. The next thing um, you want to do is, is have a good understanding of the ingredients that you're including in your, um, your software. So we want to make sure that our software components that we pull into our build are coming from reputable suppliers. This is uh, kind of trusted upstream repositories like well-known uh, Linux distribution vendors or making sure that the things we're pulling in are from the, uh, you know, the original developer that we expect, the, the canonical upstream authority. It's really easy to accidentally pull in, especially if, uh, you know, if you speak a variant of English that is different to American English, like I do, uh, you'll spell words differently, and so you might think you're introducing a package into your uh, dependency chain like Colorama, and you've put that U in that we Brits like to do, and suddenly you've got something with, uh, a very different intended outcome. Um, so we need to make sure that what we're pulling in is what we expect. And there's a bunch of great work happening to make that easier. Um, but some of that is just, you know, people taking the extra few minutes to look at the source of what they're pulling in. And once you are pulling in dependencies, once you're fetching these ingredients, you want them ready at hand while you're building your software. So reaching out to the internet during your build process um, is, potentially rife with error. The, the original upstream location may disappear for whatever reason, or it may get tampered with. Um, so having some kind of artifact store, caching your dependencies within your control uh, gives you a lot of risk mitigation uh, and can help prevent, provide something of a fire door against the upstream being changed unexpectedly. And of course, fresher is better. Um, so keep up to date with your upstream don't pull in a dependency and leave it in your uh, build for three years and, and never get the newer versions that include a bunch of fixes. I've put a little asterisk here because um, if you're using a volatile dependency uh, ecosystem like NPM or PyPI, and you try and keep up to date with all of the changes in your dependencies, you're probably going to be applying them on a daily basis. You probably want to 
Think about what is a reasonable cadence for your organization every three months, every six months, monthly, whatever makes sense, and then have some kind of automated and followable process in place to do that. Uh, but you really want those fresh ingredients. Don't let your ingredients kind of rot. And that will help prevent use of compromised dependencies, uh, provide that fire break to the upstream, uh, and prevent you from being exposed to known exploitable vulnerabilities. And on this slide, I have this term software bill of materials. I wanted to avoid all acronyms, but SBOM is such a term of power already that it was kind of unavoidable. Uh, so I, I want to introduce you to that acronym. So a software bill of materials is effectively the ingredients list for your software project. Um, which things go into producing your software and where they came from is really useful information for your own team and also increasingly desired by kind of the downstreams, the users of your project. And so the next kind of theme of advice is like a fast food restaurant, the default um, configuration of your uh, dependencies and container images and software project is going to be what most people choose. So I'm really encouraging everyone to think really hard about what they include in their software projects and try to ensure you're only using what you need. There's a, uh, a Go proverb, which is a little copying is better than a little dependency. And this causes, I, I get, um, Undoubtedly, I get questions every time I use this proverb because I'm an open source person. I've been working in open source for 15 years and people hear me say that and say, so you're telling me not to use open source? You're telling me to write everything out myself and, and not have dependencies? And that's not the case, but I think we have to be more considerate about the number of dependencies we add to our software because the more we have, the more uh, attack vectors there are, the more maintenance churn we have, and fundamentally, open source software is free of monetary cost, but we pay that cost in maintaining those dependencies and keeping up to date with the upstream. So you have to think about whether this is a, a cost you want to pay. Um, and in a similar vein, I think when you're building container images, base images, um, VM images, starting small and building up is um, really hard to do. It's much easier just to have a big image that includes everything you might need. But those things have a tendency to get shipped into production, be a nightmare to update, and uh, provide a very big um, kind of threat surface, and also just mean much higher storage costs and transfer costs for our uh, artifacts. So sadly, there's no um, perfect tooling for doing this today, but there's a bunch of open source projects you can learn about at this conference that help make it easier to build container images which are um, more suited for your specific task and help you do streamlining, adding additional content at a later date. And uh, ChainGuard are a software supply chain security startup and their CTO coined this term, the principle of minimalism that I really like. They say the default should be the lowest common denominator of what you actually need. And you can apply this principle kind of across your software production to help you think about ensuring you're not introducing a lot of um, risk to your projects by adding uh, a bunch of stuff you might need later. And so by doing, uh, by following the principle of minimalism, we reduce the tax surface, we help focus our remediation efforts, and we probably have you know, cost benefits in uh, storage and transfer costs as well. So nice little bonus there. And finally, I already hinted at this one. Uh, like a, a fast food chain, consistency is uh, really crucial uh, in software production. It helps us to be more secure. It helps us to avoid fat, fat fingering a build and releasing something we didn't intend to. And it helps us to um, really have a much more stress-free uh, software development process. If we can have a recipe that enables us to rebuild our software sort of on demand with controlled steps, gives us a repeatable build. Um, that, that's, in my opinion, table stakes for software development. Uh, and then the other aspects of this consistency notion, increase efforts um, for increased re reward, but many people will kind of stop uh, after that initial repeatable build notion. But I like to 
refer to builds as being either repeatable, rebuildable, or reproducible. So a rebuildable build is one where you can um, replicate the build with the exact same ingredients, regardless of whether you know the latest tag moved on your container images or the upstream release of new dependency. And then having a production line like build process where you can reproduce a bit for bit equivalent binary uh, has a lot of security and debuggability benefits, but takes a lot of effort. There was um, an article published recently where a project that specifically set out to provide reproducible builds found that five years later they couldn't reproduce a bunch of the things that they had built. That, and to me, this indicates how hard it is. There's so much variance, so much. Uh, so many sources of non-determinism in software production nowadays that even if you think you're controlling for them all, you're probably not. And that's why I've put here, you know, reproducible builds. Reproducibility is hard. Um, it's not worth it for everyone, uh, but I think there are significant benefits. Um, by having this consistency notion, you can prevent and detect mishaps. You make it much easier to replicate and debug your software, and you can make the modification of that software uh, more detectable. So, given the tortured analogy and the distracting pictures, I wanted to summarize the things that I just said. Uh, <clears throat> with this, uh, this slide kind of provides the, the four things uh, that we talked about in, in one view. So, when you're doing your software production, practice good hygiene, infrastructure, secrets, uh, development tools, know what you're including in your software, um, have it at hand, Try to use as little as possible, only what you need, um, and ensure you have consistent processes. So <clears throat> that was my kind of whistle, top, whistle stop tour for the fu fundamental principles that I think are necessary to be aware of for producing a secure software supply chain. What can you do now that you have this, this grounding? Well, fortunately, at this conference, there are a bunch of open source projects that work in this space. Um, I couldn't list them all, so selfishly, I've listed those which I have had some involvement in. <laughs> uh, the Intoto project is a CNCF project to enable you to rigorously define a supply chain that has end-to-end -end integrity. Uh, and they are, there are several talks at this conference about Intoto. The update framework is a CNCF project for doing secure content delivery, uh, typically of software updates, but we've actually seen some um, ingenious applications of this technology to legal documents and um, the root certificates for uh, a trusted system. Um, and the update framework is at the conference as well. There'll be a few talks, both Intoto and Tuff have a kiosk in the project area, so you can come and talk to developers of the project about it. And then outside of the CNCF, um, the supply chain levels for software artifacts project is a set of standards and controls to prevent tampering with software in production. Pretty much what I've been talking about here, but much more rigorous um, formal definition or semi-formal definition I highly encourage you to check out that project if you've got a team managing your infrastructure that would like to secure it further. And the Sigstore project is um, a project to help you sign software artifacts without having to manage uh, keys, which is really the most difficult part of signing is managing your keys in a way that uh, doesn't open you up to more risk by you know, leaving your YubiKey on a tram or um, accidentally putting your tokens in your Git repository. Uh, all you have to be able to do is authenticate against your email account, and they will give you a short-lived certificate that um, can be used to sign uh, a software artifact. It's a very cool project out of the Open Source Security Foundation. And then finally, uh, the Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework is uh, an acronym that I promise not to use. Uh, which provides some guidance around how to securely consume third-party dependencies into your um, software. So it will provide a lot more detail about some of the things that I uh, kind of touched on in the talk here. And then um, there's some reference materials for people that are interested. The CNCF has a security technical advisory group where a bunch of 
Um, leading edge thinkers in software supply chain security produce really useful uh, artifacts. There's a catalog of supply chain compromises, uh, which we'll talk about many of the attacks that have happened, how, you know, which bit of the system were attacks, uh, starting to classify them and provide a really good corpus of information. There's a white paper on supply chain security, very detailed, um, really good read if you've got the time to go through it. Uh, they then, the same team then produced a follow-on paper describing how to mitigate a bunch of the problems they talked about with a, a software factory process. Um, and so that's a much more hands-on document describing how to address more of these uh, concerns. And then I've linked to the Chengar blog on the principle of minimalism because I was very fond of it. <clears throat> so the final thing I want to say is that um, software supply chain security uh, even when you talk about it in 25 minutes. It's a big problem space. There's lots you could be doing, and it's really hard to, it's really um, easy to become overwhelmed by the scope of the work. And so the thing I like to say is that um, security is not uh, kind of a Boolean property. It's not either secure or insecure. It's always fuzzy. You are more secure. So if you can do one thing, you will help improve the security of your software supply chain. Uh, so I want to all encourage you uh, to encourage all of you to do one thing uh, and to to let you know that um, taking that one step can be pretty easy, and I'm confident that you've got this. Um, so uh, yeah, please do that. And uh, coming in a couple minutes early, I think, but um, that is the end of my content. So thank you for listening. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yeah, yeah, so one question here. Like, what will be your recommendation, for example, if we're building artifacts using Docker files, stuff like that? So you recommended about pinning the versions, you know? Um, but sometimes uh, you have like this trade-off that you need to decide between uh, pinning the hash, the specific hash that you're using, so it's very secure, very stable, and stuff like that, versus maybe pinning the major version with the fixes, the patches, and, and all of that or just like pinning a more specific uh, version. So like, what's your, what's your take on that? Basically? Yeah, good question. So when you're thinking about uh, ensuring that you have deterministic inputs to your build, do you pin, um, you, can, you can pin the major version of a release or the specific version of a release, a patch version. Um, I tend to favor pinning very explicitly the release like the specific release um, and having a process by which I can get informed about newer versions and have that automation. So if you're on GitHub, you can use Dependabot. It's pretty great. You configure it, you can configure it to tell you every you know, week or two weeks which of your dependencies are out of date and it will even write a patch for you to uh, include the newer versions. And this is where uh, there's kind of a uh, synthetic uh, um, overlap between security and quality and rigor in software engineering that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. If you've got you know, tests and um, you can take changes in with some level of confidence, then having this automated process in place is a relatively low overhead. Um, so I'm in favor of uh, that effectively. Pin your dependencies explicitly have tests that help you ingest newer versions with confidence, and then um, have a process which preferably automatically pulls in those newer versions. And a very fast follow-up on that one is, uh, if we're going to use like Dependable and all those stuff, like is there any recommendation? Because sometimes developers get overwhelmed by all of the Dependables as updates and stuff. Sometimes they just like merge it because, you know, I'm done with this this week. <laughs> right. Uh, so if I, I think your question was, um, or, or maybe statement was about the frequency of updates, right? Yeah. And so that's why, um, yeah, I think that's why I had the asterisks in the slides, and I think it's very important to define a cadence that is sustainable for your team. You know, if you're a team of two people or a team of 10 people, what is sustainable is very different. And it also uh, is affected by which language ecosystems you're using. 
But the key thing is to define a cadence, have a process, have as much automation as possible, and then follow it. So if you think daily updates are too much, I, I'd be inclined to agree. But maybe once every two weeks is something your team could manage. Uh, spending Friday morning with a coffee just reviewing the dependency updates. Um, so set that process in place, have the expectations that they're doing it, um, and you know you kind of simplify things that way, um, make it rote but uh, achievable. Thank you. No problem. Um, just one quick question. We talked about reducible builds, mm -hmm. repeatable builds, and so on and so forth. I would like your opinion on systems such as uh, GNU GUIs or Nixos, which actually try to implement these things. Uh, so my opinion on GNU Geeks and Nixos and tools like that. So GNU Geeks is the project I referenced in the talk where I said they, they set out to be explicitly reproducible uh, and they tried to reproduce builds from five years ago and, and ran into a bunch of issues and then fixed them. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of GNU Geeks and Nixos uh, while rec recognizing that for many teams and organizations that level of rigor is uh, unsustainable and un unobtainable. Um, I think there's a, I feel like there's a, an, an intermediate ground between how most people are building software and the fully defined upfront rigor of Nixos and Geeks, but I haven't found it yet and I haven't even figured out how to delineate it yet, but it's something I noodle about on my whiteboard. Um, it's a bit of a brain worm for me, so I'm a big fan of those systems. Uh, but the pragmatist in me recognizes that they're probably too much to ask of most people. It's a big leap to get there. Uh, you have to be able to define how to package every single component in your software um, to get the full benefits, and, and that's a, a huge ask. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I've heard yesterday in a different talk about Cubescape. Um, how does this fit in your suggested uh, approach? Um, I have not heard of Cubescape, so I'm afraid I cannot provide a satisfying answer to that question. Uh, yeah, the cloud native space is, is ginormous. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't have an opinion on that one. No worries, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, we've got about three minutes, I think. So, um. Yes, sir. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of package repositories out there with lots of open source, so, you know, NPM GS and, and Maven repository, these kind of repositories. Um, is there a good strategy for, you know, when you're bringing down repositories for actually scanning them for vulnerabilities, or are these repositories inherently becoming more secure because they're applying their own security scanning? Great question. So are the, is there a good strategy for scanning uh, dependencies you ingest and are the repositories becoming inherently more secure? Um, most of the dependency scanning tools can only tell you about known vulnerabilities, which is great. Like you don't want to be pulling something in that has uh, a, no, a known remote code exploitation, but the MVD base scores for these vulnerabilities are the reasonable worst case scenario. So we can't always kind of take that at face value. You have to think about how it's integrated, whether you've got you know, sandboxing of the component, whether you're even using the vulnerable API and things like that. So the scanning tools provide you metadata that uh, is a good starting point, not, but not sufficient in my opinion. Um, but yes, the, the repositories themselves are becoming more secure. They are um, integrating tools and techniques to make it um, more likely that the person who uploaded a package is the person that they were supposed to be. So, um, you know, trusted publishers on uh, registries like PyPI um, and uh, also uh, NPM have a great feature they're working on that provides a cryptographic link between the source code used to build an artifact and the artifact. So um, right now, I mentioned one of the attacks was that someone uploaded a package that had content that wasn't in the source repository. And so these kind of techniques make that uh, much less likely. So the, the registries are becoming more secure. Um, and yeah, the scanning tools are a good starting point, but there's, there's more that has to happen after you've scanned the package effectively. Thank you. No problem. Go ahead, I think we've got one minute. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the talk. It no was really practice. And, um, 
So uh, I think it's related to the previous questions. You've told us how we can improve our security when building software, but how can we evaluate that the dependencies we are using are uh, applying those principles? Yeah, great question. We definitely don't have time to dig into that. Uh, I don't know that there is a good way to evaluate it. One of the reasons that um, I think it's important for people to be much more explicit about their dependencies is because the only reasonable way to do it today is to individually research each of those projects and see whether you think they are doing software development in a, in a meaningful way. So um, the chaos group I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's community health and something. They define metrics for understanding um, how healthy an open source components uh, kind of community is. Whether so, that's a good risk analysis tool for whether whether you pull this thing into your product that you're shipping for ten years, is it likely to disappear because there was a single maintainer got um, fed up? And I think that is a good piece of metadata to include in your analysis, but it's not the only piece. There's, so there's a bunch of tools out there like the Chaos Metrics, um, the OpenSSF scorecards that will rank a bunch of security metrics, like whether people are using uh, code review on their pull requests, whether they're doing um, branch protection, whether people can push directly to the main branch, and all of these sorts of things. But there, there's there's absolutely not a single tool that can help provide confidence. And a lot of it comes down to the age-old security person's answer, which is you kind of have to understand what your threat model is and make a risk decision. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of data available. And we have to decide which signals are important. There's no, no one's doing that for us today. Um, yeah, unsatisfying answer for the, end of the for the end of the talk, but that's all I have, I'm afraid. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone for showing up. <laughs>